All right, so get, come on, give me some industries. Heating and cooling, I got the HVAC one. Automobiles. Automobiles? Why, why do you think it's hot? I want the hottest industry, like a, a heating up industry. Why do you say hot? Well, because like used cars now are more expensive than Yeah, they have been, right. So a uh, used car market's been there, yeah. Pharmacy. Pharmacy, why do you say that? <laughs> Oh, okay, okay, yeah, there has been a lot of COVID uh, short-term gains. COVID, but, like, all the viruses coming out of there. I was talking to somebody that um, luckily started a pharmacy, like, they just bought it from a pharmacist, and, you know, the numbers were fine, but they bought it and closed on it in uh, April 2020 or something. And so then they started to be good at doing COVID tests, and they made a boatload of money. I can't remember who that was, but they made a boatload of money uh, processing COVID tests. And then I heard tra somebody said travel. I can't remember. Was it Jack? Why do you say that? Uh, you know, COVID uh, dying down, you know, everyone's wondering. Yeah. Houses. Yeah, so we're, we're going to talk about industries today, um, as well as the individual companies that are there. So that's why I wanted to pose a, you know, industry model. And, and so we're going to look at supply and demand in chapter uh, this is 8, 9, and 10, so we do have three chapters. They're relatively short, and uh, the reason we do them that way is that they are connected to each other. So uh, we talked about quite a bit about the demand um, uh, the other day with demand shifters and the demand curve, but we never really brought supply into it, right, on, on what the supply curve is. So uh, that's what I want to start off today. Let's see, which one of these industries? Um, Um, the car sounds kind of good. Yeah, let's do cars. So, so the used car market. All right, so we could, uh, when we analyze a market, we could pick a particular style of cars. We're usually not talking about Chevy Malibus. Right? But we might be talking about four-door sedans when we're thinking about the market. And the reason is, is that we want a, an important part of the market is competition. So if we're talking about Chevy Malibus, we're really doing a very microeconomic analysis about the Chevy Malibu. There still would be a supply and a demand, but it would be starting to get away from this idea of a market or an industry analysis. So notice how, depending on how we define the good, we're gonna have a, maybe some different looking results. So we could look at used cars, we could look at all cars, so new and used cars all jumbled together. Uh, we could look at the uh, four-door sedans or uh, the trucks, right? And so, and SUVs. So we can analyze the market in different ways. Uh, we could say the domestic truck market um, so we'd usually be talking about uh, Ford, GM, and Chevy if we're talking about U.S.-based, although it's so global now, there's not really a such thing as a U.S. car anymore because we've got uh, all the parts. I think I remember reading somewhere that 60%, 60-70% of a U.S.-made auto is, is from other countries in terms of uh, if you look at the supply chain on, on where, what it's all being made in there. So uh, lots of different things to it. So with the, let's do trucks. So we'll talk, uh, maybe it's the four by four trucks. So that can be, and we'll go global. So this could be uh, Toyotas and, and other trucks too. So we talked about the demand curve before. And all it's saying is that there's people that would be willing to pay a lot for the truck. Um, give me an example of somebody who would be a high-valued customer for a 4x4 four four truck. Construction. Construction, right? We see that all the time because you're hauling stuff around. Uh, job sites might be muddy or something, so you might need that 4x4 four four to, to get in and out. So good. Construction, maybe another example? What's that? A farmer. A farmer, yeah. So a farmer would be a good example. And then we could get into hunting and fishing and you know people using it more recreationally rather than commercially. Um, so we've got a lot of people in here, and so probably our commercial customers would be the highest valued ones, right? Uh, it's part of their capital 
in their construction company. So we talk about machines and computers and buildings, well, they've got a truck, right? And that's an important uh, input into their, into their business. Okay, so that kind of sets the stage here that we've got multiple people who value trucks differently. And now we can look at the supply. So our supply curve is upward sloping. And so we'll look at the law of supply. The law of supply. The law of supply says as the price of a good increases, the quantity supplied does what? Increase or decrease the quantity supplied? Decrease. So as price goes up, the quantity that companies, this would, in our case would be, uh, I guess I used used cars, so we have to be thinking of uh, people who own the car already. As the price goes up, they're going to supply less? No. So I heard a decrease at first, but it's going to be an increase, right? Sometimes this can be counterintuitive because we start to think about flipping our, in our brains cost versus price. So it's real important to keep those things separate. So when we look at price, you can uh, maybe insert the going rate, right? The market price. So in our industry, <laughs> We might be saying, and, and this is why this was a good one to pick, is that we all kind of know over this last year with COVID and supply chain problems, used car prices have been going up, right? And so um, we're thinking here about the market price, the price at which you could think you could sell your vehicle for. That is what's going up, right? The market price, it's nothing to do with cost or what you paid for it two or three years ago. It's simply doing a quick analysis. My car has 140,000 miles. It's a 2012 and you know, come up with what are these things selling for, right? So the market price. So as that price goes up in a market or in an industry, then more and more people are gonna be willing to supply. So the quantity supplied increases. And then we gotta tack on some Latin. What did Cerebus, Ceteris Paribus mean? Holding all other variables constant. Holding everything else constant. So as the price goes up, then you're going to supply more. But that's not true if all of a sudden business is booming in construction. And so now there's no way that you'd sell it, even though you could get a higher price because the truck is worth more to you now, right? So we could start to pick apart lots of things that would cause the supply, this statement to not be true without adding on holding all of the things constant, things that are related to the supply. So those then bring up supply shifters. What is going to make the supply curve move? So number one is probably the most important one, the price of resources. This is what is probably the main driver of the current situation we're in. What resource goes into making a car that has been hard to get or is very high priced? Microchips. Microchips. So the microchips have been a problem. I heard that the uh, Biden administration uh, and Congress is trying to do something to uh, encourage uh, chip production domestically, which is probably a stupid thing to do, but that's what they do, right? That we, we're gonna, we're gonna uh, help the industry, and what'll probably happen is that the fat cats will come and say, oh, we'll produce chips and they'll take the subsidy, and then it'll just be squandered, or, led to golf courses and yachts and big fat cigars. I'm sorry, but that's the way government usually works. They have good intentions of trying to, uh, you know, get something going that there's a problem, but the reality is there's probably other things that may be able to be helped um, in, in the chip industry. Maybe there's some current regulations or restrictions that keeps 
uh, chip makers out. Um, so there could be things like that. It might be environmental regulations uh, that uh, it's easier to produce them in China where there's th those regulations don't exist. Um, so there might be other avenues to approach rather than just uh, the typical uh, government way of throwing money at the problem. Okay. So the price of resources, and that's pretty broad. So an increase in, you know, wages would lead to a decrease in supply, a shift to the left. And an increase in the price of chips, the price of microchips leads to a decrease in supply. So I brought the golf club today once we get into interactions here. So we're here holding the price of wages or the wage prices and the, the microchips constant. But as the chip price goes up, then the cost of doing business goes up. And so the supply curve shifts to the left. So when that happens, we were at an equilibrium price, which we haven't talked about yet, but so we were at a price of a four x four truck of uh, $50,000 average price. And we have uh, 10,000 trucks per month being sold in the Kansas City metro area or whatever. So there's our equilibrium quantity and price. But once that microchips start to go up and wages start to go up, the supply curve shifts to the left, putting upward pressure on prices. And so now those trucks are selling for 55,000 or 57,000 or whatever. Okay, questions or comments there? All right. Um, number two is the number of suppliers. So this is really our competition. One of the most important ingredients into a healthy market system, usually when markets are not performing well, it's because there's a lack of competition, like the microchip market. Something happened to where we got down to just a couple suppliers of chips. And so that is something we want to try to avoid and maybe uh, reasons we want to investigate as to why there would be a decrease in those suppliers. All right, so as competition increases, if there's an increase in competitors, let me just put it that way, so an increase in competitors leads to an increase in supply. So on the supply side here, this is the number of people willing and able to buy. But now that prices are so high, or if the demand had gone up, maybe more people would start to supply their truck. Uh, whatever that response is, that would start to put downward pressure on prices. And that might be a correction. That's the typical correction mechanism, by the way, in a market. So if there's a increase in demand for um, COVID uh, tests, if there's an increase in demand for travel, if there's an increase in demand for cars, if there's an increase in demand for, is there another one? Who said, wasn't there one more? Our hot market, what did you say, Leland? Huh? Oh, HVAC, if there's an increase in demand for HVAC, right, because it's hot out, the weather conditions change. So. If those change, that put raises the price. And some people say, oh, help us government. The prices are too high. The prices are too high. Let's put a price cap on. Well, that would be stupid because the exact reason we want prices to go up is because now is it more profitable or less profitable to be in the HVAC business? It's more profitable. Is it more profitable or less profitable to be in the car business? More profitable. Is it more profitable or less profitable to be in the travel business? More profitable. Is it more profitable or less profitable to be in the pharmacy business? More profitable. So all of a sudden the entrepreneurs and the business owners and people think, I know what industry I'm going to get into. I'm going into HVAC, right? And so as the price goes up, that then acts as a signal that that's a profitable area to get into. 
And so now entrepreneurs say, I'm going to go into that market. And so as we have entry of firms into the market, that starts to bring that price back down. It's a self-correcting mechanism through free people choosing to do what's best for themselves, pursuing their happiness, right? They're trying to maximize profits, which sounds evil, greedy, but it's the correcting mechanism in the market. That's what allows prices to fluctuate so that we can adapt to changes that happen, whether it's natural disasters or whether it's other events, maybe it's the Ukraine-Russia war, whatever it is, when prices change, people change their behavior, right? Are there people now getting into the gas industry because of the Russia-Ukraine crisis? Absolutely, right? It's opening up wells, it's doing other things that maybe weren't profitable when gas was at $3, now there's some wells being drilled in different places around the world, including Texas or Oklahoma. And so now that supply is gonna go up. What's been happening to gas prices? Starting to come down a little bit. They flattened out when we got up to that, whatever here in Kansas anyway, was around 460 or uh, they seemed to kind of flatten out, um, thank goodness, from the, the rise that was going on. Okay, so those are market mechanisms. And then of course, Biden jumps in and says, Let's reduce the tax. Let's put a cap. Let's put some restrictions. Let me go call up Chevron and the executives and just say, hey, you guys are being too greedy. Why don't you make some more oil? Why don't you, be, you know? And it's like, dumb. The market's gonna correct itself. Probably a lot quicker than any legislation is going to change. By the time Congress gets around to doing something, it's another six months down the road and the, the market probably has corrected itself already through competitive forces of free entry and exit into a market. Okay, questions or comments there? So that's the type of thing that we'll be getting into in, the, in these chapters um, uh, tonight and then for the upcoming work this week for week four. Um, number three here, let's go ahead and put expectations. If there's an increase in the expected price of gas, that leads to an increase in the supply today. So if we start to think that gas prices are going to remain high for six months, a year, five years, whatever, then that's going to change supply today. So expectations can fall in different ways. One of the big things is expectations about the economy. Are people tending to start to think, expecting recession or expansion for the overall U.S. economy? Recession. recession, right? So by having, expecting recession, are companies starting to keep some of their cash or are they expanding and buying new trucks for their construction business? They're keeping it, right? So we start to change our behavior today based on our expectations in the future. So that has a big role in uh, the supply as well. Okay, um, we could probably tack on a few more, but I think those are the main ones I wanted to hit um, for supply related stuff um, uh, for now. All right, so that's our industry, that's our market. And the next thing I wanna get into is a little more, uh, what does this mean for the company? You know, what does this mean to be in a competitive market? And so this uh, chapter will look at um, competition and we'll also look at monopoly. We'll kind of look at two ends of the spectrum. And so that's what we're gonna start off with is a, a spectrum of competition. What does it mean to be in a competitive market versus a market with just a few sellers or maybe even one seller? So here's the spectrum. So at one end of the spectrum, we have what economists call perfect competition. What does a perfectly competitive market look like? And at the other end of the spectrum, we have no competition or monopoly, a true, a true monopoly, which for the most part doesn't exist, by the way. Uh, true blue monopolies. 
So both of these things really in some ways don't exist, but it gives us our brain kind of the areas of where reality exists on the spectrum somewhere. So with perfect competition, we have three characteristics that we want to keep in mind. Number one is there's a large number of sellers. Large number of sellers. So in terms of competition, it's ferocious, right? There's lots of them. Uh, I like to bring out the old can here. So how many sellers are we talking about? Well, again, conceptually, if this can was filled up to here with water, and I took out an eyedropper, and I put one drop of water in, would you see the water level rise? That's how many, right? So there's so many sellers, each seller is just a drop of water in the bucket. They're all very insignificant. So if there's 10 billion bushels of corn, each farmer's making 100 bushels, right? So 100 bushels, if that farmer quit making corn, it wouldn't affect the market at all. It would have to be a large number of the farmers changing their behavior together. So that's what we mean by large number of sellers. So a drop of water in the bucket. A drop of water in the bucket. Number two, all of these sellers are selling the same product. So we say a homogeneous product. All products are identical. One farmer's corn is indistinguishable from another farmer's corn. So in other words, you don't have any edge in, uh, from what your competitor's selling. We do see this a little bit on um, like Amazon, right? So there might be multiple sellers of the same retail product. So this marker bag might have, you know, 10 different sellers selling this, mark this marker bag, right? And so what tends to be the differential between the prices of marker bags between these 10 sellers on Amazon? How many pennies apart are they, right? So that's gonna drive people, to, as long as people are being savvy and, and, and shopping around, then there's not gonna be much room for them to uh, charge higher prices. It's gonna be a very competitive price and they'll probably be within a few pennies of each other. Now, when we start to get into multi-product stuff, which we'll do next week, maybe a seller has marker bags, but they also have the best markers on the market, right? And maybe they have a kind of a niche with a particular type of marker which is these markers, by the way. Uh, this is from the pen. So maybe you guys have seen me doing the refillable marker. I hate these. These I detest. You can't see them, right? You guys see how nice it writes, this one? So I keep that going. So if you have a special knit niche with your markers, maybe now you can get a little bit more out of the marker bag because people are coming onto your website they're spending $150 on markers, and they're like, oh, they got these marker bags. Oh, that's only $6. Maybe you can get them on Amazon for five bucks, but who cares, right? I'm just gonna pay the six bucks. I have a $100 order of markers coming anyway, so that might be able to give you a little bit of an edge on your pricing uh, through bundling products together, which again will be more of our topic for next week. Okay, so the last condition is free entry and exit. Free entry and exit. So that means that it's very easy. So it's easy to start the business and end business. How easy is it for you to enter the market? So becoming a seller on Amazon, they try to make the barriers pretty low because they want people to do it, right? So you might have to sign up and register or something and maybe they do some sort of background check to make sure you're not some sort of thief, uh, but you can start selling your products on Amazon probably pretty quickly. All right, any questions about all three of those? So that's our one end of the spectrum and our other end here, number one is one seller. Right? The goal of the game, the board game Monopoly, was for you to own all the properties, right? And then you can jack up the rents or whatever. So Monopoly has just one seller, 
by definition. And I said earlier that there's not too many examples really out there of monopolies. Um, they've usually disappeared by now, or they have a little bit of competition. So, you, you know, in general, we might be throwing out Facebook or um, Google or whatever. But there's other search engines, other products that, you know, kind of keep them in check. Uh, they might not be very good substitutes, but there is some substitutability uh, if Google started to become too onerous to use or too many ads or whatever, right? And then all of a sudden, they know that it's easy to enter and so some other competitor would come in. So that's what we call a contestable market. So we might have a market with just a few sellers, but if there's pretty free entry and exit to get in, then the market is very contestable. In other words, somebody's gonna come in if we jack up the prices, right? And so let's not jack up the prices. Let's keep the prices at a fairly competitive level and then that way other people won't enter the market. That's a little bit of what happened, by the way, with the, um, with the OPEC over the years. So we have Saudi Arabia, who Biden went on his knees and asked for free oil or whatever he did over there with his fist bump. I don't know if you guys follow the news, but uh, I don't agree with that move at all, but whatever, you know, the Saudi prince is the one who killed uh, the journalist. Um, so that was kind of a big news item here this last week. Um, but, so the Saudis, have, you know, I, I can't remember what Saudi Arabia looks like. Let's say it's here. And then we have uh, Texas. There's Texas. All right, and there's Saudi Arabia. So these guys can drill oil. The oil, massive oil reserves are just sitting like three feet down. Like they can put a golf club in the ground and all of a sudden oil is shooting out, right? So it's really easy and cheap for them to pull oil out of the ground. Meanwhile, in Texas, they gotta go down, you know, 60, 70, 100 feet. I'm making all this up, by the way. It's longer than three feet, I'm sure, over here, and, and longer than 60 over here. But, you know, we've got oil too, but it's costly to get down. So what keeps the Saudis and, and OPEC in check is that they can't just raise the price to whatever they want with oil, because the higher the price gets, all of a sudden it becomes profitable for the United States to start competing. And then the last innovation that we had is the horizontal drilling. So now we can stick that drill down and all of a sudden we shove another drill in here and we can get into this oil well over here. So horizontal drilling and fracking, all of those innovations have made Texas able to compete with the Saudis a little better over time. And so now it's even helped uh, the overall price. Okay, so that's again kind of the nature of these industries. Questions or comments there? All right, so we've got one seller. Um, we got a homogeneous product, just because there is only one seller, right? So a homogeneous product for a single product monopolist. So we've got one company producing one thing. The reason I bring that up is that we can talk about multiple products, like our economies of scope definite, uh, definition, but here we're just thinking, Homogeneous product, one seller, one item. And then finally we have some barriers to entry. Barriers to entry. Okay, I've been talking a lot so far. I'm just trying to kind of get through some of this stuff. But give me some examples of barriers that keep competitors from coming in. Me some examples. I'll look online too if one of you guys just raise your hand if you want to have a quick flash of an idea. All right, Caleb, go for it. Uh, licensing. Licensing. Okay, so there could be some sort of government restriction that uh, maybe they only allow a certain amount of businesses in the area to operate or in that state to operate or something. Uh, and that could, that could be, by the way, in other countries too, not just uh, uh, the United States. John? Capital intensive, what do you mean by that? So it requires a lot of in upfront investment to get going in the industry. Okay, good. So we got licensing. Um, Caleb, I'm gonna just add in patents, copyrights. So there's all kind of basically government granted, government regulations or laws 
that could create a barrier to entry for companies. So that would be, I guess I'm gonna call this A instead of a star B. Um, Jonathan, you said a high cost of entry. So Boeing and Airbus are pretty much the primary airplane makers. Why isn't there more airplane makers? Well, you need about $500 billion to start up an airplane making uh, plant or something, right? So it's very costly to get in uh, to the business. Okay, other ones coming to mind, barriers to entry. That's a pretty the good start of a list. Access to materials. Access to material, okay, yeah, that's a good one. So, um, so you've got special, uh, let's just put special access to resources. So one thing I heard, uh, what do they call that uh, mineral that is used in our cell phones that's over in India and China is where we get it from? What do they call that special mineral? It's like got kind of a simple name. What is it? You guys know if you know what I'm talking about. So is it what? Uh, no, that's not what I'm thinking of. Lithium? No, well, lithium is actually part of it. I think you're right with that. Uh, but I think there's something else. But anyway, these minerals or lithium or whatever do exist in the United States. Um, but again, there's regulations on access to them. So they're talking about that's I think that was part of related to the microchip thing too was um, access to that so yeah you might have some sort of barrier because you need a special resource to be a microchip producer and that might not be available again that might be a little related to the government thing um, but not necessarily it could be the, the mining rights so uh, do you guys know who the famous uh, diamond producer is JC probably knows since he was from that neck of the world Diamonds? Yeah, for diamonds, the blood them. diamonds. It's the name of a company, De Beers. Does that ring a bell? No. So they had exclusive access to mining uh, diamonds. They found diamond mines, and there's some movies called like Blood Diamonds because they killed people for the property rights when they wanted it. So there's kind of some interesting, not so good history on diamonds related to the De Beers monopoly. And so they were pretty much the single supplier. Um, and then innovations of cubic zirconias and other things that were, you know, decent substitutes. And then there was other mines that uh, were found later in the, in the world. But it really was primarily in Africa where most of the diamonds for a long period of time were controlled by De Beers. Okay, uh, any other barriers? Nobody brought up Government. violence. What markets do we see violence being used? Maybe uh, kidnapping, rape, break your arm, cut off a limb, torture. What markets do we see that being used a lot in? Sex trafficking, drug, Sex trafficking, drug trafficking, all of that stuff, right? So illegal markets that can create a barrier to entry, right? Why, why aren't you gonna go sell your cocaine in that neighborhood? Well, I'm gonna get my ass kicked, that's why, right? So you're, or my family's gonna be harmed. And so that can create a barrier to entry in some markets. So violence. Violence. So think mafia, broken arm. Uh, gangs, mafia, whatever. Illegal markets. Human trafficking, all that stuff. All right, well that's a pretty good list here. So now we got the idea of why we see sometimes things not working well. Um, my inclination as an economist when I hear of a problem in society is I go to the spectrum. I really do. I, I just kind of think, well, oh, prices are too high, prices are too low, there's, you know, people are dying in this particular industry. Maybe it's the opioid ep epidemic. Whatever, you pick a problem, my brain goes to this. 
uh, if, if it's related to prices and other things, but it can be, it can be deaths and, and uh, non-price things too, is to think, well, what's the problem? Is that what's being bought or sold? Is there, is there competition? You know, is there differentiated? Is there uh, ability for other people to enter the market or is there some government restriction that keeps them out? So this is a good kind of check base to go. <clears throat> All right, so now let's talk about the middle. The real world lives in the middle. There's really not much of a, uh, any industry that follows all of this perfectly. Um, agriculture used to be probably one of the ones, but now they tend those uh, combines and other things tend to have a pretty high cost of entry to be a farmer, right? Maybe not to grow stuff to sell at the farmer's market, but if you want to really try to make money at, at farming, you need a $500,000 combine and, and uh, land and all of that stuff, right? So we had a few people that were, well, who's the farmers in here? Got a couple of different farmers, yeah. So uh, we've seen that industry start to get more and more concentrated. Um, you know, pretty much I think I've heard farmers say, minimum you need 2,000, 3,000 acres just to even get into the game a little bit to, to compete. Why? Because there's economies of scale. What's that? What's economies of scale? Increase parking to lower average. Yes. So why do we need 3,000 acres? Because those farmers who are getting 3,000 acres can do their bushels of corn at five dollars and still make money, right? Because their uh, their operations are big enough with those big combines to take down the 2,000 acres and the wide enough girth on their machines and the access to chemicals and and the treatments. You have to be a player at a minimum of this 2,000, 3,000 acres. Those farmers who are trying to have the little, my, I, my grandpa and grandma had a 150 acre farm for 100 years up in Minnesota. And so what happened to the family farm over time? They just had to rent it out, right? They kind of got pushed out of the market. But when I was there, um, I was helping to harvest uh, some of the uh, either uh, corn or soybeans or other things that were on the land. And so then we had a different situation in the market that evolved over the last uh, 50, 40, 50 years and keeps going that way. That's one of the things that keeps, um, oh, places like India and developing countries is that this economies of scale thing is kind of not easy to do when you don't have good property rights to your land um, and you can't get to that scale very fast. And so we tend to see subsistence level farming. There's been experiments where they tried to uh, basically do it as a collective. So, you know, if we have a hundred small family farms that covers 3,000 acres, can we somehow jointly work together to act like a big player, right? But you can imagine the coordination issues with that. But that, that's a concept that's been tried in uh, developing countries and in other places. All right, so back to our spectrum. <clears throat> In the middle here, we have various levels of monopolistic competition. Monopolistic competition. <clears throat> and so monopolistic competition allows for a differentiated product. So the only thing that's different with monopolistic competition is number two. We have a differentiated product. <clears throat> so we go to buy shampoo at Walmart and there's 10 different, probably more than that, but 10 different shampoo choices, 10 different companies, right? And so the shampoo industry now has a differentiated product. And so that's the way most things are. There's multiple companies offering a slight variations. So the real world here is in monopolistic competition. We preserve this idea for the most part, large number of sellers, easy uh, entry and exit. As we start to drift this way on the spectrum though, we might start to get fewer and fewer sellers, right? So now we're down to four sellers or 10 sellers for the most part, or the ones that primarily control the market, but maybe 10 is enough. Right? So we kind of start moving down the spectrum. These variables start shifting and shuffling a little bit. We start to lose some or of the other. And then on this end of the spectrum, 
we have what we call olagapali. It's kind of a fun word that is pretty much only used in economics, but oligopoly. You maybe heard of the oligarchs in Russia that are being clamped down on, so it's kind of a similar thing, that we have a few sellers. So what we're gonna change here with oligopoly is number one, there's gonna be a few sellers. <clears throat> and when we get to this chapter, which will be in like week seven, week six, week seven, um, this will be a, our few sellers will act strategically. So we get into strategic behavior when we have a few sellers. Number two is a little bit different too. It can be homogeneous or homogeneous or differentiated. So I mentioned OPEC yesterday, our oil producing countries, the Organization for Petroleum Exporting Countries is what OPEC stands for. And it's oil, right? One country's oil is identical to another country's oil. The oil, the raw crude oil is homogeneous. Whereas we might look at cell phones in the United States, how many cell phone producers we got? Let's name them. Verizon. Verizon. AT&T. AT&T. T-Mobile. And what about Sprint? T-Mobile. Whoops, they are T-Mobile, right? So we lost that one. We had four and now it's down to three. So again, we're moving down this spectrum. Will all three of those eventually combine to be so that we just have one seller? of cell phone? Or will the government just take it over and you know they probably do a good job of uh, providing cell service to us? I'm sure they would be able to do all the fancy innovations. Maybe that you know that would be a good thing to just have government take over of cell phone industry. So that that's a possibility. That happens in some countries by the way. Um, so especially countries where we do have uh, significant control of, over um, in the government, more centrally planned systems, um, then they want to run the airlines, for instance. So Air India. Uh, we saw Air Zimbabwe when, we, when I was in Zimbabwe. And so Venezuela, Venezuelan Air, I think is what it was. Wasn't that Samir? So the government can start to take control of industries um, as, a, as a possibility with, if they're not uh, protected with by the Constitution and uh, changes in law happen or whatever. Okay, still barriers to entry then with oligopoly. All right, so that's kind of the real world. And so we, when we analyze industries, whether it's travel, pharmacy, uh, used cars or other things, we kind of want to plug into this thing on where are we at on the spectrum, right? That, that'll help uh, our understanding of the market. Okay, questions or comments there? All right, so now let's look at individual behavior. So we're gonna look at the uh, economic model of perfect competition. So if we understand this model, not only will it help you answer some of your uh, tests and homework problems better, um, but it should give you a better understanding of how markets work with individual incentives and players. So we're gonna draw two graphs side by side with each other. So make sure that you leave enough room on your paper, but make them big. And so to the left here is our market. So we're gonna put big Q and let's just call it the uh, corn market. So I'm picking something that would be more competitive, again, as I said, with uh, high cost of entry. It's not maybe as competitive as it used to be, but should help motivate things. Next, draw a supply and demand curve. Doesn't matter really how steep or flat your lines are. So we got corn suppliers. So here's our farmers willing and able to supply corn. And then we got buyers of corn on the demand side.
Okay, so this is kind of where we started tonight, right? Supply, demand, some industry. Over here then is our representative firm. Our representative, representative firm. One drop of water, right? One drop. Because it's perfect competition, all the sellers are looking the same anyway, so it doesn't really matter. So we're just gonna look at one of them. And so let's put a little Q here instead of a big Q on the horizontal axis. So that's to distinguish that we're talking about this farmer's corn. So this might be uh, Farmer, Farmer Joe. So Farmer Joe is over here, and little Q is the amount of corn that Farmer Joe is making uh, for the market. Joe, are you up for being a farmer? I guess for today. <laughs> All right. So now, the price of corn gets set by a large number of sellers and a large number of buyers in the market. So we can look up the bushel price of corn and let's say that it's uh, currently $6 is the market price of corn. Um, one thing that I guess I don't wanna take for granted, uh, I won't write anything, but let's kind of at least walk through a uh, little thought experiment of why is it where the two lines cross where I'm saying it's going to be six dollars that that's the market price so imagine envision that the price was higher like eight dollars at a price of eight dollars we have an imbalance going on that imbalance is that at a price of eight dollars the quantity that farmers are producing is here a high quantity and at eight dollars people are buying we go over to the demand curve and drop down this quantity so the quantity being produced is greater than the quantity being purchased at a price of eight dollars and if that's the case what's going to happen let's talk real world now let's pretend we are um, Oh, let's get away from corn and you know pretend we're the liquor store here in town and this is cases of beer so at the way it can't be a case of beer what is it? a six pack of beer so we're a six pack of beer is at eight bucks must be natty or something but um, and now the quantity supplied is greater than the quantity people want to buy at eight dollars you're the liquor store owner what do you observe at the end of the night you have a surplus we have a surplus of beer, right? There's a lot of beer on the shelves. So what do I do tomorrow as the liquor store owner? Lower the, Lower the price, have a sale, have a coupon, put a sign out front that says, today only, you know, 30% off beer. And everybody starts coming in. So they drop their price to $4. Now what do we observe? What does the liquor store owner observe at a price of four? They're open from 10 a.m. to 10 p.m. as their hours of the liquor store. We have a shortage. So by the time we rolled around to 3 p.m., all the beer was sold, right? Now, how do you feel as an owner when you opened up? Is that a good position to be in? Or what might you be kicking yourself over? You missed some money. I missed some money. I left some money on the table, right? So I priced the beer at $3.00 and it was all gone by 3 p.m. I had seven hours of shift. People are coming into the door saying, where's the beer, where's the beer? I knew you'd screw me over, you, you, this was just a bait and switch. Now you want us to buy that high priced Bud Light, uh, you know, whatever. So now you've got customers that are angry or whatever. So tomorrow then you raise the price again, right? And maybe you raise it up to seven and you're like, oh, there's still a little bit of beer left over, let's cut it down and then you drop it to five. And then again, you, now you have inventory up till 7 p.m., but you're still open until 10. So each day what we're doing is we're kind of going through day-by-day -day operations. These managers, these owners, they've never had an economics class. We're talking real life here, right? This is running a business. You're kind of groping your way through, like what should I sell my beer for? What should I sell my beer for? Well, you tr experiment 
and you eventually find kind of the right price, right? What is that right price? Where the price, the quantity that you're supplying at $6 is equal to the quantity people wanna buy, right? The quantity demanded equals the quantity supplied. So at a price of $6, we are now able to get rid of 100 cases. I supply 100 cases and 100 cases are purchased. So that's the equilibrium quantity and the equilibrium price. And that's the nature of it. So both sides of the market have these incentives. I kind of ran you through the liquor store owner, but I kind of mentioned the consumer. So the consumer comes in and says, I would have paid $4, I would have paid $6, or I have a party tonight, I'll call them up, I know you're having the sale on, on beer, but I can't get off work till five. Set some aside and I'll give you an extra buck or two, right? And so now we have incentives on the consumer side to see prices go up when they're too low. Because when there's a shortage, these guys are happy, right? That these 50 at this price, if this was 50, these guys are happy, they got the cheap beer, but these guys are mad. There was this many more people that wanted to buy 150 or something, right? And so these guys are the ones that are angry and that they didn't get the cheap price. So yes, we all like low prices when we can actually buy at those low prices. And that's why we need the market to be kind of free to adjust to external uh, circumstances like war and natural disaster and other things for that to equilibrate, for the market to come together and harmonize the behavior of consumers and the behavior of producers. Okay, questions or comments on that? A little bit of an aside, but I wanted to run you through that. All right, so we got the $6 equilibrium price. And so now I'm a drop of water in the bucket. So the first thing I wanna look at is what's the demand for Farmer Joe's corn? Well, the demand curve for Farmer Joe's corn is flat because if Farmer Joe produces uh, 30 bushels of corn, then he's gonna get six bucks. That'll be the price people are willing to pay for Farmer Joe's corn. What if Farmer Joe doubles his production to 60? So what? Uh, you're a drop of water in the bucket, six bucks. What if we go up to 90? Six bucks, six bucks, six bucks, six bucks, six bucks. And so the demand curve is perfectly elastic. Remember we talked about elasticity the other week. So a real steep curve is inelastic, but a flat curve is perfectly elastic. So Farmer Joe is a price taker. So Farmer Joe, we'll put a couple notes here. Farmer Joe is a price taker. He is just a drop, just a drop of water in the bucket, and therefore takes the market price. He has no market power. Whatever the going rate is, is what Joe gets for his corn. Okay, so we talked about marginal revenue last week and the week before marginal benefit is what we started off with, so marginal analysis. So what is the revenue generated by the 60th bushel of corn for Farmer Joe? Now we're looking at Farmer Joe's business and maybe it'd be helpful to think back to what's the profit equation that you guys have memorized now? Price times quantity, okay, I'll take that. What's that called? Total revenue minus total cost. Yeah, so Luke just went kind of an extra step there. Total revenue minus total cost. Total revenue is price times quantity, as Luke said. Uh, this time, maybe for this example, I'm gonna put a little Q just as a reminder that now we're looking at Farmer Joe's operations. So it's the quantity of corn Joe makes times the market price. 
minus Joe's average total cost times Joe's quantity, or Joe could think of it as the difference between the price, market price and the average total cost of all of his operations, including fixed costs and variable costs, remember, all of that stuff that we built on from week two, or that, was that even week one? Week, yeah, we introduced it, I think, week one, times the quantity. So that's the equation for Farmer Joe's profits. So now, back to my question. What is the revenue generated by the 60th bushel for Farmer Joe? Six bucks. What about the 67th bushel? Six bucks. What about the 30th bushel? Six bucks, six bucks, six bucks, six bucks. And so I'm gonna use a different color. I'm just trying to put it right on top of each other. But just so that you think of them differently, the demand curve is the marginal revenue curve. They're equal to each other for Farmer Joe because the demand curve is perfectly elastic and Farmer Joe is a price taker. All right. So, Farmer Joe is not immune to the law of diminishing marginal product. Nobody is. Even our monopolists, wherever you are at on the spectrum, nobody's immune to the law of diminishing marginal product. One of the top principles of economics. What is it? Okay, and what do you mean by returns? Uh, there's something else changing as we did it. So think of me in the restaurant. And now you guys, this is the part of the show where you can flip back in your notes and look at the law. I wrote it on the board. The law of diminishing marginal product. The law of diminishing marginal product. Once somebody finds it, read it off. All right, JC, go ahead. As you have more of a variable resource, to at least one fixed resource, the additional labor and eventual resource. The additional resource. Res the, the product, that's the product part of it. So the product from the production, the, the productivity of that additional resource falls. So the example was me in the restaurant, the grill top, one rust, two rusts, three rusts, four rusts. I keep adding a variable resource of rusts to at least one fixed resource, the grill, the productivity, the amount of hamburgers that each additional rust can make eventually falls. That's the return part. And that, that can be tricky remembering, oh, is it the input or the output? So it's the output that's diminishing from additional units of a variable resource. All right, so none of these guys and gals are immune from the law of diminishing marginal product. The law of diminishing marginal product gave rise to a certain shape of cost. What cost curve did it connect to? What did I stitch that to? Marginal cost. So marginal costs are going up or down? Up. So the cost of each additional rust, I gotta pay rust 10 bucks an hour, right? I gotta pay everybody a minimum of 10 bucks to get them off the couch and stop watching Netflix to come work for me. So each additional rust is 10 bucks. But the seventh rust I hired isn't making as many hamburgers as the first and second and third rust. So that's a pretty expensive rust, right? So the cost of the hamburgers that the seventh rust makes is higher than the cost from the hamburgers that the third rust made. That's kind of the connectivity that if you guys can pull that away from this class and apply it in a variety of ways to workplaces that you eventually go out to, you can be a superstar. You can start to impress your boss by thinking that way. Okay, so on this picture, I got the 30, 60, 90 thing. So when you guys draw this, let's go ahead and have the J-shaped marginal cost curve. So it's going to bottom out at 30, cut through at 60, and then go up. So there's your marginal cost curve.
All right. How much corn should Joe make? 60. 60. 30 looks kind of tempting. How many people are thinking 30? To maximize profits, isn't that the biggest distance between revenue and cost? Revenue, cost, isn't that profit right there? On those units, so what do you mean by that? Well, there's still profit on the other units you make beyond that. That's just the greatest profit. Okay, okay. it's the greatest profit on that particular unit, specifically the 30th unit, right? That's one unit. So if we were at 30, the logic that we walked through that we had for our, our quiz and, and other things you've seen is, what if I produce 31? Would that be a good unit to make? Yes, because the revenue generated by the 31st unit is greater than the cost of the 31st unit. So you're making money on it. Same thing with the 32nd unit, the 31st unit, all the way up to the 59th unit. For the 59th unit, the revenue generated by the 59th unit is $6. The cost of the 59th unit is $5.95. Is it a good idea to make the 59th unit if you can make a nickel on it? Yeah. Now, should we make the 60th though? We're making nothing on the 60th, right? Marginal cost equals marginal revenue. Yes. Should I make it? Why? Because you're covering your business costs. Uh, yes, we're covering them, but are we just indifferent or not? What do economists always include in their costs? A uh, full opportunity cost. We uh, delineated that with what types, two types of cost. The accountants did one for sure, and the economists added on another. Good. What did, what did you say a little louder? Implicitly. Implicit and explicit, excellent. So the full opportunity cost of doing business is your explicit cost, which is what the accountants do, but also the implicit cost, the implied cost of holding on to that apartment building. Remember the Cadbury example and other things, right? So we have opportunity cost fully covered, which means you're still gonna earn a normal profit on the 60th unit. It's okay to make $0 in economics class, why? Because you can't do better elsewhere. You're covering your full opportunity cost. So it's okay, do I wanna make more money? Of course I wanna make more money. But it's okay to earn zero dollars on the 60th unit. If I make the 61st unit, you're stupid. The cost of the 61st unit is higher than the revenue from the 61st unit. All the rest of these units, especially the 90th, we keep getting worse and worse as we move this way. So to maximize profit, the holy grail of business, is what I like to say, is right in front of you. Always make products when the revenue generated by the last unit is at least as much as the cost. If the cost ends up being greater, don't do it. Back up, go this way. So you're maximizing profits, which is what our assumption is of the business, is to maximize profits by producing 60. Okay, so let's write that out. I'll come back over here. By the way, um, you know, sometimes there's always these big debates about, well, what about the dual bottom line? What about conscious capitalism? What about uh, blah, blah, blah? So people want to bring in uh, non-monetary factors, basically, non-profit factors into the for-profit business model that we have multiple concerns. I say, so what? We've got explicit and implicit costs, right? And so if part of the uh, derivation is that, well, we would do this, but now there's going to be a cost on something else I care about, then you just adjust that into the equation. So that still applies to all of that stuff. That logic is still the same on um, this, the, the approach to solving the problem. All right, so um, holy grail of business. So objective of firm is to maximize 
profit. And again, we could get more complicated with it by adding some non-monetary factors, but let's just keep it, keep it simple. A little KISS principle here. So objective of the firm is to maximize profits, and here's the holy grail. To maximize profit, a firm should produce the quantity where the revenue where the revenue generated by the last unit produced which is the marginal revenue curve by the way right a firm should produce the quantity where the revenue generated by the last unit produced is just equal to the cost of that last unit. Which is our marginal cost curve. So a shorthand notation, I like to kind of write it out with full words. But we're producing Q star, little q, where marginal revenue equals marginal cost, where the two intersect. All right, questions on that? And kind of just the whole marginal analysis thing that we're doing now applied to the firm as it relates to the industry. So we're kind of adding on layers as we go. All right, well, how much money is this profit maximizing firm making? How much is this profit maximizing firm making? 60, 360. So 360, you're taking six times 60. So six times 60 gives us 360, but that's total revenue, right? That's price times quantity. So that would be 360. How much is it making? Is there like an area or something, Jonathan? It would be the area between the, the straight line and the, the J. Okay, and the J, all right. So Jonathan's pointing to this region, right? If this was the profit from the 30th unit, the 29th unit, the third, the fourth, so if we kind of added up this area, you would get the wrong answer. But that's the best try. Given what's up there, that's the best try. What's missing? Average. Average what? Um, no. Total is what we want, right? So we need the average total cost to calculate the area. What would Jonathan's analysis be missing? It's a good one to bring up. Because it's kind of like our markup, by the way. Remember price minus marginal cost? That's kind of what we're doing a little bit with that, with that area conceptually. What is being missed out on? Average total cost equation equals what plus what? Fixed cost. Fixed cost plus variable cost on average. So average total cost equals average fixed cost plus average variable cost. What's missing off of that analysis then? The fixed costs are not included, right? Because marginal cost, one of our uh, equations for marginal cost was the change in total cost over the change in quantity, which we then derived was equal to the change in total variable cost over the change in quantity. So when we look at marginal cost, we are ignoring fixed cost. But for total profits, we need fixed cost in there. All right, so you guys might remember that it's bowl shaped and bottoms out. We'll be taking a break here in a couple minutes. I want to leave you cogitating on this. How much money is this firm making now? Let's 
So we said holy grail of business was to produce 60. Is the firm making money at 60? Given the average total cost curve drawn there. How would we calculate, because I think some of you are still struggling a little bit graphically here, if I ask somebody to come to the board to tell me what the average total cost curve is, and remember, we have a full schedule of numbers here, I just make them up as I go, but I know six is right here. How would we calculate the average total cost of making 60 units? Graphically, what would you do? Imagine this is your arm right here. Tell me what to do. What's the cost of uh, the 60th unit? How do you know that? What curve are you using? The marginal cost curve, and what are you doing to get it? Starting at 60, what are you doing? Up to the marginal cost curve, which happens to intersect all three here. Hang a left, read off that number, is six bucks. What's the average total cost of producing 60 units? What do I do? 60 times 60. Go where? Up to the average total cost curve. That's the part that I think some of you maybe are still struggling on. You're going to have to get comfortable with it. And it's $9. How much money are we making? Now you can calculate the profit. You've got enough information to fill in this equation. So we got six minus nine times 60. 180 negative. 180 negative. Nice holy grail. Would we be better at producing 30? No. Would we be better at producing 90? No. So to maximize profit is the same as minimizing losses. There's no better quantity to produce than 60. So yes, you are maximizing profit, but you also might be minimizing your losses by producing that quantity. All right, we'll pick up there after break. It's 730, so we'll plan at quarter two. Quarter two. Okay, Jeremiah and Maddie, did you guys do the quiz? Yeah, you did. Okay, good. Maddie, you too? I did not. You did not. Okay. So you can do it late. You're going to lose some points, but... Maddie, can you see that? up if you can? Yes. Okay. Yes, I can. All right, go ahead. Submit that late.
for like two hours. 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 Two hours.
crops, whatever. So there just seems to be not enough money. And this is probably kind of a true story, right, for the small family farm um, that they eventually chose, we gotta, we, gotta go, we gotta go out of business. We're gonna just sell the farm. We're gonna rent out the land or whatever. So the opportunity cost of renting the land, they can still own the land, but they're gonna rent it out and not run the actual farming operation anymore. So what ceteris paribus assumption changes over here for the industry? number of suppliers so whatever one that was on your list that we started off at the top of the class the number of suppliers and so as people leave what happens to the supply curve does it shift left or right no. left as it shifts left what's happening to the market price it's going, up. it's going up right and so that's the adjustment that's going to take place in this market um, there's going to be eventually a price that will bring us back to a sustainable level of production for the individual farmers. When is it going to stop? When they're just earning a normal profit again. So um, we like to think of profits being a signal. So in the long run, if you are losing money, the signal of negative money, oh, I already erased it, the, the negative $180 is exit, 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 in the long run, if that's a signal that you're getting from the market. And so as they exit, price goes up, and eventually when is the exiting gonna stop? When the farmers are earning a normal profit, when they're back to profitability, uh, not excessive profits, not monopoly profits, not, you know, not too high because there's still competition, but they're gonna be earning a normal profit. A normal profit is zero economic profit then the profit signal is extinguished, or the entry and exit signal is extinguished. If for some reason too many people left, or how about this, as we're going here and we get up to this price, we figure out how to run cars on corn. What happens now? What ceteris paribus assumption has changed? Demand shifts, right? So now, Farmers were going out of business, but then another event happened that was separate. We learned how to run cars on corn, and demand goes up, and maybe demand shoots up to here. And now, some of those farmers went out of business. They might be kicking themselves that they weren't able to hang on for the ethanol revolution. Uh, but now there's excess profits, big profits being made. Farming, farming, plant corn, plant corn, lots of money, big dough, big profits, big money. What signals, what's gonna happen now in the market? Entry. Because there's free entry and free exit in a competitive market, now people are gonna start coming back to farming. And so maybe the demand curve was up here and now the supply is gonna come down and it's gonna bring those profits back down to normal. So in a competitive market, one of the long run conclusions that we get is that profits are normal. They're fair, if you will, right? Because competitive forces keep it in check, not Biden or Trump or Bush or Obama or Congress throughout the years. They're not what keep the market in check. It's competition that keeps it in check through entry and exit of firms competing with each other, sometimes ferociously. Uh, to keep prices low and fair. So they're earning a fair profit. So sometimes when I hear, you know, Wells Fargo makes $20 billion in profit this quarter. You're like, huh, that's some pretty good money. You know, and some people might think, well, 20 billion, nobody should make 20 billion. There's gotta be a problem with that. And so as an economist, I just sit back and say, well, is there competition in the banking industry? What do you think? Is there competition in the, does Wells Fargo have competitors? Yeah, right? So if there's healthy competition, government regulations, that one starts to get a little questionable in the financial markets, but there is other banks. If Wells Fargo's not doing good, people are gonna take their money elsewhere. They're not gonna get loans from Wells Fargo. They're, they're gonna move, right? So if I hear 20 billion, eh, it's probably normal. 
It's not a lot of money. For how much money they have invested, 20 billion is probably about right. Is it possible that next quarter they're gonna be down 5 billion? Possibly, right? Financial crisis or something else. So all of a sudden you, you take a different attitude towards economics and profit and greed and blah, 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 capitalism. When you start turning to competition as a corrective mechanism to kind of shape and efficiently get products into people's hands, transforming resources into valued products. That's what we do in a market-based system. And as long as there's competition, we can set back and say, ah, the money that they're making, that's probably fair. That's probably fair. Otherwise, if it was unfair, somebody would make it fair. They would enter the market and, and compete with them. And that's the mechanism. So this whole supply demand framework really sets the stage for us understanding price changes. And that's the important part of uh, learning uh, supply and demand. Okay, um, let's see. I think that's all I wanna say there. I'm gonna write a couple of those notes down that I just said underneath the bullets. So long run conclusions of competition. <clears throat> given the resources used. Why do I know they're not being abusive? Because if they were abusing it, somebody would enter the market and compete it away. They would take away that advantage. That's what competition is. So competition is key. Number two is that we end up having uh, production at a minimized cost. So at the market quantity, we are at the minimum of the average total cost. So costs are minimized. I didn't get into that with this picture, but it's just one of the conclusions that we're operating efficiently, right? We're minimizing costs. <clears throat> So then the last thing I'll say, we don't get into different types of efficiency too much, but we have uh, different types of efficiency. So the quantity produced is efficient. What do I mean by efficient? Uh, there's not another quantity that would make the world a better place. So there's not another quantity that makes the world a better place. That's a real loose definition of efficiency, but I didn't, I didn't want to crawl down that hole, but um, there's nothing being wasted. Right? And so when we think about production efficiency, there's no wasted resources. Everything's kind of humming along at an efficient level. Okay, so what about monopoly? So we're not gonna spend a lot of time on this, but the, the chapter gets into monopoly, and so the important distinction we need to make is when you're a monopoly, you are the market, right? You are the supply curve, so you face this demand curve, not this demand curve. So we kind of change the game that you are the market. So you are a price maker. You face the downward sloping Demand curve. Sometimes we say you've got market power.
All right, so kind of a quick little rundown of this. Draw the demand curve so that it's touching both the vertical and horizontal axis at its endpoints. So the key with a single price monopolist is that in order to sell more product, they have to drop the price, right? And so by dropping the price, not only are they dropping the price for the next unit they're selling, but they're dropping them for the previous. So let me give you an example. Let's just suppose we're at, uh, maybe I'll use my $6. Except instead of talking about corn, we're talking about something else. Maybe an airplane or something. So let's go 100. So right now the monopolist is selling 100 units at a price of $6. To sell another unit, they would have to drop the price. I'm gonna make this jump a little bit bigger here. So 101, they'd have to drop the price to $5. Now looking at those two points, something big time has happened to the marginal revenue. What is the revenue generated by the 101st unit? What is the revenue generated? Remember over here, we did marginal revenue, six bucks, six bucks, six bucks. What's the revenue generated by the 101st unit? Five. Everybody saying five? Jonathan's not? Marginal revenue. Um, it would be negative 595. Negative 595. Why do you say that? Because it's 600. Well, six, yeah, you're losing a dollar on the, the hundred you're selling so far. Okay. Sorry, it would be 95. So here's the thing. We're to sell the next unit, and I, I picked some pretty dramatic numbers here but intentionally. To sell the 101st unit, I had to drop the price to five. That's where you guys were at. So we're to the good plus five. So we're plus five dollars. But if I'm a single price monopolist or a single price company, I drop the price not only for the 101st unit, but all the previous units too. So that hurts. I just lost that area, which is, one dollar times a hundred, I lost a hundred dollars on all the previous units that I sold. And I gained, I gained this area. So we're plus five, minus a hundred, gives me minus $95. So that's what's happening with revenue, right? So I probably don't want to do that. So the marginal revenue curve is different than the demand curve. It's not equal to it. Um, let's see, I think I'm gonna, I think I'll leave this. So this is marginal revenue equals, and so this is the 101st unit, and then this is the previous 100 units. I lost the 100 just to kind of that math straight. Okay, questions on that? All right, now let me give you the real picture. My slopes and stuff aren't that good there, but I got the negative. Okay, so. Let's go back to this picture, one of my favorites. So you have this in your notes from before. So if this was a thousand units, this was a thousand units. So they're connected vertically. What were we measuring downstairs? This was the demand curve, price and quantity. What were we measuring downstairs? 
what was the curve that we did? Not marginal revenue. Nope. Total revenue. Total revenue. So what we measured on the vertical axis was total revenue equals price times quantity. This is where we had the discussion of if I cut my price, law of demand says I'm going to sell more product, but what's the balance between the two, right? If the price effect is bigger than the quantity effect, my revenues go down. If vice versa, the revenues go up. So we have revenue mountain, which was if you take the midpoint of where the demand curve intersects, that gives you revenue mountain. That looks like this. So upside down parabola. I use this to highlight the elasticity issue, if the demand is elastic or inelastic. But now what I want to do is show you how that connects to revenue. So this is total revenue being measured. And so the marginal revenue line starts here because the revenue generated by the first unit is basically the price of the first unit. And now it is twice as steep and cuts through that point. And then as we just found out in the illustration, in the thing we just did, marginal revenue actually drops negative. We don't usually draw that part reasons we might talk about here in a second. So marginal revenue is twice the slope and lies below the demand curve. So the red line is our marginal revenue. So anytime we have market power, we have a downward sloping demand. So this falls into that, uh, any of the oligopoly or the monopolistic competition, we start to have a downward sloping demand curve. Now, a little bit tougher question is, if we start to have lots of substitutes, what happens to the demand curve? Does it get flatter or steeper? if we start to have, so let's talk about uh, fast food industry, maybe even fast food hamburgers, but lots of competitors, right? Go down to South Main Street here during lunchtime, you got Arby's, Wendy's, uh, Burger King, McDonald's, we got Starbucks coming in now too. So all kinds of choices. My question is, when you have lots of availability of substitutes, does the demand curve get flatter as people enter, or does it get steeper? Flatter. So it actually starts, oh, now I got my perfect competition. Perfect competition was perfectly flat, right? So if we have close substitutes to each other, we're just gonna have maybe a little bit of slope, but even if there's a little bit of slope, we still have a red marginal revenue curve that is twice the slope lying below it. So you'll see that in some of the problems when we get into uh, companies that face a downward sloping demand curve, which is most of them, by the way. Uh, conceptually, we've got the perfectly competitive market, but as we have fast food market, it gets really flat anyway, so it's kind of immaterial. All right, so why do we not usually draw this? No one escapes the law of diminishing marginal returns or marginal product or the law of diminishing returns. And what did that give rise to? What did we create from the law of diminishing marginal product? We did it earlier. I'm just repeating what we did earlier. What cost curve? Average cost. Marginal cost. The J-shaped marginal cost curve. So, voila. Let's do it. There's the J-shaped marginal cost curve. Nobody, a monopolist or a perfectly competitive firm, escapes the law of diminishing marginal product, which means they face the law of increasing cost as they add additional russes, whether they're the home, only hamburger show in town or whether there's lots of hamburgers to pick from. Nobody gets away from it. So here's why we don't draw this part of the curve very often, because the profit maximizing quantity 
costs are always going to be positive, not negative. So we're never down in this region. It would never be optimal to do. Now, are there companies that operate in this region? Yes, they're, they're inefficiently like, you can be here. Lots of companies, unfortunately, actually operate here. The cost of this unit is here. The revenue generated by this unit is here. What should they do? Cut back. They should raise their prices. A lot of small business owners. I uh, uh, had a uh, student that their family ran the um, caramel corn, not caramel corn, kettle corn, kettle corn business. And I went to there and one day her mom or her were kind of lamenting like, oh, dad's thinking about selling the business. You know, it's a lot of work to go to the county fair. You know, they're running the fairs and selling their product. And so I saw them there and, and I looked at their prices and they were selling it for 450. And I'm like, you need to raise your price. When's the last time you raised prices? Oh, we couldn't do that. Our customers would be upset. Okay, so you're thinking about closing your business because it's too much work and too hard, but you won't raise your prices because you're gonna make some people upset. A lot of businesses make this, a lot of small businesses make this mistake especially. Right, because you start to get close with your customers, and you're like, oh, I don't want to offend them, or whatever. But when it comes down to that, raise your prices. So, did they take my advice? No, not right away. But the following year, they raised their prices a full buck on a, a buck or two on a on a 450 price. So that's like a 25% increase in price. Guess what their customers did? They still bought it. They're like, it's about time you raise prices. I can't believe you hadn't raised prices in that long. So they didn't skip a beat on selling popcorn because demand was inelastic. We were operating in this range. So basically, conceptually, at that price, it's like looking at a demand curve like this. You're not going to lose too many customers, right? So raise your prices. What you're really doing here is you're moving this direction. If you do lose some customers, that's, that's okay because you didn't lose too many of them, right? So demand was inelastic. So they're like, oh yeah, we like selling popcorn now, <laughs> right? Now that they're making a buck more per bag, uh, all of a sudden that can make a difference when you sell 400 bags at the county fair. It's 400 bucks. All of a sudden, that was dumb. Why didn't we do that five years ago, right? But that, that's how you learn. I mean, you just, uh, I, you know, I could have been wrong on it. I don't think on this particular case it seemed like a no-brainer to me. But So what about starting out though? Like... You know, starting out sometimes people start too low because prices start to get sticky. Um, I talked to a subway owner um, when they, remember it was $5 foot long? Remember that promotion years ago? This was like 10 plus years ago. And uh, the $5 foot long ended up staying around for a long time, right? And then what they found was that when they had to raise the prices to $6, people were so anchored with the five that they were mad and went to other sub places. So they lost a lot of money by keeping that promotion too low. Now that wasn't a startup business, which wasn't your, which wasn't your question, but a lot of times with a startup, you start too low too. That my, my advice would be to really try to think a little higher. Again, it, it depends on the circumstances, you know, you might need to, prove yourself and gain trust and gain a customer base. Um, but you might want to use like uh, coupons instead of your pricing. So like a hundred dollar price tag, but here's a $25 coupon, right? So you're effectively selling, but now if they don't have the coupon, you're back to your normal price of a of hundred. So you might want to try stuff like that. Um, uh, if you're in a situation where you're not sure about the pricing too. Okay. Any other questions or comments? Okay, so this guy maximizes profits, this profit maximizer, like everybody else, holy grail, produce the quantity where the revenue generated by the last unit is equal to the cost of the last unit. The difference now is that we're gonna charge the highest price people are willing and able to pay for that quantity, which is right here. So the price that the monopolist sets is according to the demand they're going to set this price of whatever, $10. Just making up a number. So the mechanics are similar to produce the quantity where the revenue generated by the last unit is equal to the cost of the last unit, the same as Farmer Joe, but now we're a price maker. We're going to set the price 
and make it be the highest price people are willing and able to pay for the product. All right, questions there? So that's, this part of it is true along the whole spectrum. We've got some level of either a relatively flat demand or maybe it's a steep demand, but conceptually it's the same for all real world businesses. This is probably the situation that they're in that they have to be thinking about. Yeah, John? So all industries face the downward sloping demand curve, but when you're a drop in the bucket, it doesn't, you don't see it from that perspective. But when you're a monopoly, you're the entire industry. So that's why you're facing the downward sloping. Yes. So um, if I was to draw a monopolistically competitive market, I would probably you know, draw it like this. And then the marginal revenue, twice the slope, would look like this. And what happens is the analysis is very similar to perfect competition anyway, because there, there's not much difference here in the markup. You know, it's not as dramatic as this, the difference between marginal cost and the price. Anything else? We still get the thing, uh, we still get the results that we don't want one company, you know, one company is going to restrict too much. As we have multiple companies competing with each other, the demand curve starts to look like this, which gets us to our long run conclusions of competition. So these still hold in that respect. Okay. Anything else? All right. Um, let's go to the big screen. Chapters 8, 9, and 10. up if you guys can see that as the screen going to screen share. Okay, good. A lot less technical difficulties this week, thank goodness. All right, so give this a read. So this sounds good, right? Good to be in the generator business. There was a problem they ran into. Can you predict what it was? Thinking about some of the things we've been talking about in class, it turned out the easy money wasn't that easy. Think about portable generators. Everybody know what that is? Where we got the machine, you're pulling a cord when the electricity goes out. Y2K, the world was coming to an end, party like it's 1999, a little Prince tribute there, did you catch that? What do you think went wrong? Think short term versus long term. Did the world come to an end? So what would be your prediction on demand? What's that, Leland? It, it went back down, right? So what did they do in response? They invested a lot of money. Well, that's based on needing to produce X amount of generators per year of this amount. But that wasn't going to persist. Whoopsie, right? So now when the market returned, they're sitting uh, with too much equipment. 
So, when we think about the market, the author's kind of highlighting what defines the market. So, is it the United States? Is it global? Is it a state of Kansas? What's the geography? Is it all online, which then essentially opens up the world, maybe short of shipping or something? Uh, what's the product? Uh, how is the product defined? So here we got portable generators. We could, like I was talking earlier in class, go to small generators, big generators, right? We could d slice and dice up generators, domestically produced generators versus uh, foreign produced generators. All of that stuff is defining what is our good. The more broadly we define the good, what happens to the demand curve? in the industry. This might be easier since portable generators isn't quite as there, but if we go back to my four by four truck, four wheel drive truck, and we look at US four by four trucks, and then we compare that to four by four trucks produced by anybody globally, which demand curve is steeper or which demand curve is flat, or whatever is easier for you. Which one has more substitutes? The four by four, is it the domestic or the global? Which one has more substitutes if I define the good more broadly? The global one has more substitutes? Or does Ford, GM, and Chrysler have substitutes? So let's kind of make sure we know what we're doing here. So it's called the game of kick the demand curve. Is it demand curve A or demand curve B? So which one is U.S. Auto versus all autos, or all, I guess, let me, let me do trucks, I guess. I don't need to change uh, U.S. trucks versus all trucks. Which one is the U.S. truck demand curve, A or B? A. So if we're thinking about trucks and you want a truck, where can you do more shopping? Which one would have a more elastic response? So if this is, I won't get into the details, but let's just start here at uh, $50,000 for our truck. So we can think about it this way. If if you are U.S. autos, are you moving along this or this curve when you raise your price to 55000 Are you losing a lot of customers or losing a little bit? Just a little. Let's see if I can tee this up a little bit differently. Um, if we're looking at the demand for US autos, do people still have the option of buying a Toyota? Yeah. Yes. So which demand curve is it, A or B, if US automobiles all rise in price to 55,000, are they gonna lose some customers? What are they going to buy? Or do they have to buy another US auto? No. Right? So, where is there more substitutes available? The global. So, when we define this, which demand curve is which, are we looking at the demand for US autos? They're going to be more sensitive to price changes with. Uh, a more narrowly defined good. 
So when we think of US autos versus all trucks, this one includes the Toyotas and BMWs and every other truck maker. And so if truck prices go up to 55 and people still need a truck, there's not gonna be as big of a response for that demand curve versus this one. Okay, so all of that said was just how we define the good it is important on what shape it'll have. If we define things as fast food hamburgers or all fast food products, because is a Chick-fil-A sandwich a substitute for a Big Mac? Yeah, it really is, right? I mean, if, if, if Big Macs double in price, will you eat a few more Chick-fil-A's? Yes, so they are substitutes, right? They're not, you know, of course, we're, we, we can be biased towards um, one meat or the other, but they are substitutes, so there would be some, some changes. And then finally, the time frame. Are we looking at the year or uh, the month, the day? All of that matters. Okay, so this is stuff that I'm gonna buzz through pretty quickly uh, because it's stuff that I covered earlier, but just as a little review, you can kind of read it along. Um, here we're highlighting things that are under the company's control versus things that are out of control. So Russia, Ukraine war, out of my control. In my control is maybe some advertising, offering a warranty for my truck, right? All of that could change the demand for my truck. So we have things that are controllable, things that are out of our control that will um, that can shift the demand curve. So once we have that ceteris paribus assumption changed, then we're gonna have some movement of the demand. Okay, so the old Microsoft Apple. Lots of uh, case studies and things over the years. So give this one a read. So what do we know about Apple? What, how are they different from the PC? What's that different operating system? Who makes it? Apple. Does Apple make everything for Apple? Yes, they sanction everything, right? So that's been their business model. And Microsoft actually took a different approach. So Bill Gates' vision was to allow the operating system to be on an HP or an Acer or a Dell or other computers, right? Whereas the Mac, the operating system is the Mac and the hardware. The hardware and the software are all in one. Well, that turned out to be a pretty profitable move for Microsoft, as the story goes, because they were able to keep it low and that made it attractive for business customers. So how the computer market evolved was that Macs pretty much stayed residential, right? It was the users of those. It's now changed a little bit as we learned that they had awesome graphics and stuff. So graphic designers and, and those uh, artsy people were using Macs more because they just had better, um, better power than, than, the, than the PC. But for most business type uses, point of sale, swiping a card, creating a spreadsheet, all of that stuff, all the business uses, uh, Microsoft really dominated, and so that ended up um, giving them an edge with businesses. So, the point with this is that when we shift the curve at a certain price, we're moving it to the right or to the left, because the price is the determining factor. So what is the quantity that people wanna buy at $4? Well, it's this amount, nine. What about $8, it's this amount. What about the $10, it's this amount. So when we change one of those factors through whatever mechanism we did, now at $10, they used to wanna buy this much, but now they wanna buy this much. At $6, they used to wanna buy this much, but now they wanna buy this much, right? So the demand curve has relocated to the right. All right, there's our supply curve. So we've got the law of supply. Why do they slope upward? 
And then take a guess what was our other upward sloping curve tonight? Marginal cost. So supply curves slope upward ultimately because marginal cost curve. Remember, the marginal cost is what was dictating how many units will the profit maximizing company supply, right? If costs change, they supply differently. So the supply curve is really the aggregate of all of the marginal cost curves that each company faces. So the supply curve, you can now start thinking of it being the marginal cost curve uh, for the industry. All right, so here's our equilibrium definitions. So at the price, like our $6 for the price of corn, quantity supply equals quantity demand, right? We have that happy medium. Nobody has incentive to change. No surplus or shortage. All right, so a couple different ways to look at it. Graphically, we're at $8 and a quantity of five. Sometimes for some problems, you might just get the schedule of numbers and you don't have this. So it's like a different way to view the math is that here we've got price from 12 to four, 12 to four or whatever, down that way. And then we have the quantity demanded and the quantity supplied. And so five and five, those are equal. So that's our demand schedule. Demand and supply schedule is what we call it. So the text, the author likes to talk about moving things from lower valued uses to higher valued uses. And so you remember when I said my efficiency, I guess I still have it written here, that the, there's no other quantity that would make the world a better place. That's the way the author's been putting it in that context. There's no way to reorganize production so that we're getting a, a bump up in value in wealth creation. Okay, so now we've got the interaction of supply and demand, which we've done a little bit of. Demand increases, drives up price to $10, quantity goes up. How did that portable generator market look? So here was kind of the evolution of it when they were preparing for 1999. They got a bunch of sales. But then as you guys predicted, demand goes up, prices go up, but then we went back down to the normal levels that we were at before, and now prices are less than what they were long term. So, computer prices continue to fall. Especially when you consider quality, right? So how have prices gone down? Isn't the supply and demand, don't we like these things? If we just said demand goes up, prices go up, does that mean demand is low for our devices? What's the story with computers. How can we have prices going down when it seems like we're all addicted to these things, just like cocaine and heroin? I mean, let's all admit it, we're all a little addicted to these things. So how did price go down? What's that? Maybe because the uh, price of the components is less than when computers first came out. Okay. There could be some of that. Now let, let's build on that, Kim. Other people, she said the price of components might have went down. Why would those have possibly gone down? What are some reasons? Technology innovation. Innovation, technologies, economies of scale, right? So uh, we have fewer computers, but now that we're making millions of computers, those chips are really cheap and some of the other components are cheaper. So that could be part of the story. So, um, as demand went up, as our addiction increased, what would happen to price again? It'd go up. But then what was the story that we just said in the long run? What happens when prices go up? 
What's the response in the long run by profit-motivated people? What do they do when they see markets where prices are hot? Go into the market. They go into the market. Supply increases, right? So that same story is really the story of our electronics is when we had our um, changes over time, we have uh, continuations. Oh, I thought there was one more. I think there's too much here. <laughs> but demand goes up, supply is outpacing demand. So we might have a story just, I thought there was another picture that did this, but demand is increasing, but supply is increasing even more, right? And so we started here, demand is going up, but boom, people enter the market. And so they continue to enter the market. And then I think as Kim was pointing out, um, innovations and economies of scale and the supply of products allow the cost to go down. So people just, there's still money to be made. There's still money to be made because cost is falling. There's still normal or profits that are above normal. So you continue to enter the market. Okay, uh, any questions or comments there? These last two on this we're going to skip. There's not another one on this. Okay, that one, commercial paper. And we're gonna skip that one too. All right. So let's see here. Da, 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 da. Chapter nine. Okay, so let's see. Sorry, you guys are still catching up. It's coming for you guys. Go ahead and give this a read. Okay, so you guys have seen these books before, right? It's like telling the story of these great businesses and the money that they've made. Um, and then they ultimately go down. Why do you think that would be the case here? Why do you think the successful firms aren't necessarily successful because of their observed behavior? What led to their success potentially? What are some reasons this guy is attributing it to their management. Oh, these guys were great. They were, you know, super duper managers. JC? Uh, in the book it says that you need to get rid of the people who get picked up on contributing on the bus and get the right people on the bus. Okay. So yeah, maybe lacking, uh, moving people around to better positions or different positions. Um, what did uh, President Eichner uh, always say? Um, Deselecting, I think was his term. So when we have a little shake up at OU of somebody getting fired, basically, he's like the most, you know, one of the things that people don't do quick enough is deselect. So we hired somebody and now they're gone. Uh, if they weren't a good fit or they whatever, let's not wait two years for them to kind of wreck things longer, adios. And so you can select people for a position and people get deselected for positions. So uh, Eichner was a Harvard MBA, so he was pretty hardcore that way. Um, maybe, maybe sometimes uh, to a fault, what some people would argue, but um, he kind of was always thinking about those things on the value added in different places. And OU um, was losing about $5 million a year uh, we could have fallen by the wayside like some universities because uh, we had a couple years of sustained losses. That's when Eichner came in and uh, did a lot of the deselecting and did some, some difficult decisions. And guess what? I'm working at Ottawa University in 2022, right? So uh, he definitely made some changes that arguably maybe saved the university back from when we were looking, things were looking really bleak. Our student population here in Ottawa, Kansas, at one point, got down to 350 students. We have 850 now here at the Kansas campus, uh, but that was pretty ugly 
The buildings were still here. Imagine we're at 850 today. You guys who are, a lot of you have been undergrads here, you know what the campus feels like. Imagine if there was 350 people here. When I started, there was 550. I started in 2011. So some of that stuff are things to go. So, um, you know, dude, sometimes people get lucky. Is there such thing as luck in business? Or is it all cold calculating? You can be a little lucky too, right? And so I think some of this could be attributed to um, a, a, an expanding economy or something else happened that, you know, maybe they weren't the greatest managers and that's why they didn't stick around. Uh, maybe some of it was luck. So uh, we'll talk more about that in some future chapters as well. <clears throat> Okay, so here's a little rundown of the things that we covered earlier on the whiteboard. So we we'll kind of give this a quick read. The price taker, our decision making. <clears throat> One thing I didn't highlight earlier, but in a competitive market, price is marginal revenue, right? We did that on the perfect competition. We said. Price was $6, marginal revenue was $6, $6, $6, $6. So we can now start to think in a competitive market, basically, if the price is greater than the cost of the additional unit, do it. If not, then don't make it. And that's how we get our profit maximizing quantity. All right, questions or comments there? Basically, kind of a little review. <clears throat> So here's our signals. If price, and the author uses AC, that's my ATC, right? That's the average total cost. So in the long run, you need to cover all of those costs. If you've done everything, you exit. And our prediction would be a normal rate of return in a competitive market. So what does that mean? So here's a, an analysis, I can't remember what industry this was, this was from one of your textbooks, on what happens to price. How soon do we get to uh, normal profits? And so early on in the phase, there can be volatility of uh, firms, but now once the market stabilizes, uh, the data here from this particular study was after seven years. So if you come up with a new whiz-bang idea, if you are an innovator, you gotta make your money early. That's kind of the moral of the story, right? Before the copycats come in. So make sure you price high enough, Joe, if you have a, a whiz-bang idea of a new business, don't start too low, make sure you're priced high enough because you need to make your money early before the copycats come and your competitors enter the market and reduce your uh, profitability. So I'm not sure how to phrase this for some of our uh, students in China right now, but because you might not, uh, you probably know San Diego, I don't know if you necessarily know Nashville, but ocean, what's the temperature like in San Diego, people? 85. 85, and then it gets really cold in the winter, and then really hot, like, no, it's like perfect temperature always. How many of you have been to San Diego? Not too many, really? Okay, one, two, three, just a few of you. Okay, well, it's, it's pretty awesome. Um, it, uh, I, I was told I was the most unlucky person when I visited one, one of my trips to San Diego because it, it rained, and it rained like a good part of the day. And So we went into this diner to eat breakfast, and they said, you guys must be the most, we told them we were visiting from out of town, you must be the most unlucky people on the earth. I'm like, why? It doesn't rain here. Like, you, you're here when it's raining. That, that just doesn't happen, basically. So, close to perfect temperature. All right, so with that background then, suppose San Diego is a lot more attractive than Nashville. What's going to happen with assets and people? What's the migration going to be? 
Where are we going to go? San Diego, holding, starting at an equal starting place. Let's say that uh, prices of uh, products and homes and whatever um, are equal. What's going to happen in these two areas over the long run? Where are people going to move to? San Diego. San Diego. What's the effect in the market for real estate? The prices are going to go up. Prices are going to go up. The supply is relatively fixed. We can start to get into multifamily or other things, but really you've got an area of land that's a, a constraint. Uh, so now demand goes there, prices go up. How high do they go? That's kind of what, the, what we're trying to get at here, envisioning the market. How high do they go? What's the difference between Nashville and San Diego? What's the price difference going to be? How much do they value the weather? Yes, that's right. So now all of a sudden we can price weather. Who would have guessed it, right? We can price sunshine. We can price that it only rains five days a year or whatever. How do we price it? Well, the value of a property, an acre of land, or maybe it's a similar size house in Nashville is 150,000 and it's 550,000 in San Diego. So that differential between two identical assets is attributable to the immovable uh, attributes of San Diego versus Nashville. Does that make sense? Plus you got the port and other things uh, since that's off of the ocean. All right, so that's what we're thinking a little bit there. And so the same is true in the labor market. What is an embalmer? What does an embalmer do? Uh, yeah, let me get somebody who hasn't talked. This is an easy question, I hope, for somebody. Somebody who hasn't talked to you. Go ahead, what were you saying? Like you said, mummifies. Mummifies, okay, yeah. So kind of, kind of mummification. Anybody want to add on to that? What do embalmers do? Is that where they drain the blood out of the body? Yeah, drain the blood, put in liquid in between. It's basically part of the mortuary services, right? So. Why do embalmers make more than rehabilitation counselors? Both have a, a bachelor's degree. They both spent equal amounts of tuition at Ottawa University, but yet embalmers make more than rehabilitation counselors. Why? Yeah, it kind of sucks to deal with dead bodies versus live bodies, right? Now, some, I don't know, you know who we're talking to exactly, but who wants to deal with dead people? if we call them people, corpses. That doesn't sound fun to me, right? Would I do it if you paid me 125,000 versus 60,000? I could learn to like a dead body, right? So there's a number, everybody's got their number. Now, are there some freaks out there that would say, I'd work on dead bodies for 5,000 extra? Yeah, right? So I don't mean freaks, I, I, I take that one back, but, but People who, maybe their view of the world is distorted, is what I meant by, the, their, their preferences are unique. Their preferences are not in line with the average human's preferences. Is that a fair, better way to say it than maybe a freak? Maybe it is. So, uh, so I take freak back and now I replace it with their preference structure is such that it's unique compared to uh, the average person. So. Anyway, the point is that those people will find that um, pretty attractive. And so that might be an area that they start to go into and they'll make more money because there's still a lack of supply of people to do that. Um, one thing I wanted to add on since we're in the talking about labor, remember when we're in the resource market, we did this during week one, the supply and demand curve here, my W is a wage, so we've got the labor market, for instance, supply and demand. And we have an equilibrium wage of people getting paid and so many people getting hired. So equilibrium quantity, equilibrium price, but we're just in the resource market. But when we're in the resource market, remember that the supply is not a business, but these are the households. And the businesses want to buy labor. They want to buy your time. So the business is the demand curve, the households are the supply curve when we start talking about the resource market. So don't, don't forget that. 
Now, what if we think that 725 is too low for the minimum wage? And we say that minimum wage should be $15 an hour. What happens in the market when the government imposes a minimum wage that's higher than the market? What do we call those people? Or what do we call it? Luke, you wanted to say something? You with your question. Maybe. Sorry. Price. What do we call that when we have a minimum wage at $15? Do a lot of people want to work? Yeah. Yeah, $15 would be great. That would get me off the couch. But what's the problem? Your demand for workers is low. The businesses reduce the quantity that they want to hire at $15. And so now back to my thing I threw out, what do we call those people? What do we call these people right here when 130 people want to work, but there's only 70 people being hired, what do we call these uh, 60 people here? Unemployed. Surplus or a shortage? And Surplus. Yeah. Yeah, is it a surplus or shortage? It's a surplus. A surplus of what? A surplus of people who aren't working, which we call unemployed, yes. So that's the rub with putting minimum wages is that it causes unemployment. I mean, if you want to help people out, why not make it $100 an hour, right? If that worked, why not make it 25? Why not make it 30? Well, it's a living wage. Well, it's not living very well when you don't have a job. Right? So that is the problem with um, the government kind of entering those markets. Now what's interesting here is um, the minimum wage is $7.25. Is that what people are usually getting paid in Ottawa here? If you go down to McDonald's or work at the hardware store or find a job with basically low to no skill, how much are they gonna offer you in today's market? 10, minimum of 10. If not 11, 11.25, check out people at Aldi. I saw they were hiring for like 15. Somebody here locally was 18 even. So, so what's the deal here is that the government says 7.25, but the market says, well, that's dumb. I'm, I'm, I'm a business that needs workers, right? So I am offering $10 an hour. So do we need that? Well, no, because now if the government bumps it up another five, we're still going to have unemployed people from imposing a minimum wage above what the market wage is. But right now, the market wage is higher than the minimum wage. And so it's kind of a political football more than an economic reality that it's going to really help people to raise the minimum wage. Okay, and there's arguments for and against, but most economists wouldn't be in favor of that. There are some economists that would argue some other things that we don't have time to get into that to me don't hold water, but um, I'll talk to you after class if we need to do that. All right, so compensating wage differential. So do you have another example like in Balmers versus rehabilitation counselors? Anything come into mind where you've got a low, no skill job that's getting paid at one place higher than another? I like to pick on low, no skill, because then we, we get away from like, oh, you have a better education than me, or whatever. So kind of a high school graduation, high school graduate, low, no skill, who's getting paid more money, and, and those of you who are in Ottawa, or if you have other examples, I'm open. Yeah? Well, I don't know if it's the same here, yeah, but um, you could compare construction to somebody working at Boswell. Yeah. Because construction is like high risk. They get paid more automatically. Okay. Opposed to somebody else. Yeah, good. So, the, yeah, yeah, I'm glad you brought up the risk. So, you know, when we start to mention construction, you, you could start to get into skilled stuff, but there's a lot of unskilled stuff too, right? So, if you're just assisting a carpenter and he's like, hold this ladder, <laughs> you know, sweep the floor, uh, go grab me the nails, grab my hammer, right? That, right. that would be low, no skill, but yet the construction worker is going to be paid more than the fast food worker. And I think you're absolutely right. There's a little bit more risk potentially involved. And there might be some other things as well. So that would be a good example. Um, here in town, anybody work at Walmart Distribution Center? Or anybody working at Amazon? 
or other places like that. Walmart Distribution Center, I saw a sign up, 2125, I think. Then they used to be 18 just a year ago. $21.25 an hour to work at Walmart DC. Low, no skill. Or go work for McDonald's for $10.50. Why the difference? Physical labor. Physical labor. You've got to be busting it. Probably no AC either. And the big one here locally, this is kind of the local story, no AC at the Walmart Distribution Center. So these folks are lugging heavy stuff, so it's physical work, and they, had, they, they were working out in these conditions in a hot warehouse and hot trucks loading that stuff. So, um, so they have a decent amount of turnover, but from all I've heard, it's a, it's a great place to work, and they do a compensating wage differential. Yes, we don't have AC, but hey, we're paying you 21 25 So we're, nobody's forcing you to work here. You can work here, you don't work here. The market is taking care of the differences. Okay. So the same is true in financial markets. And uh, what I liked about Joseph, right? Josh. Josh, you're Josh. Where's Joseph? Oh, you, I got Joe. Oh, okay, it was Josh. I was putting the, the H on the end there. Okay, so Josh said the risk, and um, that's what's true in financial markets too. So how do we get the price of a product? What is the expected return? So this is kind of one of our formulas here. What is my price in the future versus what I paid for it today divided by what I paid for it today, right? That's gonna be my expected rate of return. So I'm gonna buy a classic car for $20,000, and I think that thing's gonna be worth 30,000 uh, five years from now. So what's the rate of return in kind of simple terms? 30,000 is what I expect to get. Of course, we'd have to do present value stuff if we're doing multiple time periods, but I'll ignore that for now. Uh, 30 minus 20 divided by 20, right? New number minus the old number divided by the old number. So same thing's going on here with financial assets. So why does one financial asset pay off a 15% return, and another financial asset pays off 10. Reason, risk. So what, the one paying off the 15% has more inherent risk. What types of risk? There could be default risk, uh, interest variability, um, all kinds of risk that we, can, that we can look at. And so that is a... a similar to our compensating wage differential is a compensating price differential for risk. And so riskier assets uh, have a, a lower price, but maybe a higher expected rate of return. Okay, so um, just gonna mention this. Uh, government bonds have historically been considered risk-free. Why? Because the United States, and this is US government bonds, the US has an awesome track record of paying off their bills. Why do they have that track record? Well, we're kind of learning why now. They'll just print off more money to pay their bills. So now we have to take inflation, so it's a little bit riskier maybe now, but um, we used to have basically low stable inflation, and so now we can use a government bond, if the government bond is paying 3% and the stock market is paying 7%, the risk premium is the difference between those two. And so what's interesting here is, if we go back to 1900, this is the premium, the difference between the government bond and some other, let's say, stock market investment or otherwise. And so it's kind of fluctuated through here over time. And then we started to fall. And does anybody know what happened in 2001? The dot com bust. So we had kind of this faith in institutions that got a little too trustworthy, and then ultimately we had problems, and so now it's kind of spiked back, uh, sp spiked back up. Okay, questions or comments there? All 
All right, quick little review of Monopoly. You guys can read that first part. This is what we've uh, closed earlier. In the formula there, the elasticity is the old elasticity of the year. Here? Yeah, when we're calculating it. Well, what do you mean by old and new? That's old price and new price when we're calculating it. The elasticity is still just a number, remember? Yeah, so like it says your elasticity went from negative 5 to negative 4. We're using the calculation, you use the old. Oh, if it, yes, yes. And it's here, it's the absolute value of that. Um, so the, the point this is trying to make is entry, which is what I was talking about, the demand curve getting flatter, right? So as more firms enter, the demand curve gets flatter. And so this part here is, is showing how that is going to change with prices. So the elasticity getting flatter means this is getting bigger in absolute value, which means the expression is making this get uh, smaller with price going down. Okay, um, let's move on to the next one. We're gonna skip Kleenex tissue, even though it's kind of interesting. All right. Chapter at a glance. Okay, so this last chapter um, discusses a couple theories of what companies try to do to maintain a competitive edge, right? How can you keep a competitive advantage um, in the market? What are some things that, that you can do? So there's a couple areas to, to look at. So this is a sustainable competitive advantage, is this SCA, so Warren Buffett has had stuff to say about this. <clears throat> and so what can we do? We're making money today is there something that we can kind of put a little barrier around it? One of the things that uh, companies do is ask for the government to get regulations to create that barrier for entry, right? So if they can convince um, the government to, well, we gotta protect the consumer and we're gonna help you government. I remember Mark Zuckerberg uh, a few years back when Facebook was in hot doo-doo for, um, security breaches and stuff. And Zuckerberg went to Congress and said, oh, we will work with other companies and we will develop uh, strategies to protect the consumer. We'll, we'll help you out. We'll spend some of our billions. You know, you've heard I'm a billionaire. Well, I'm gonna share some of that. And we'll reinvest into the community. And so you gotta kind of read through that a little bit of what Zuckerberg's doing because it's a good strategy. If I can make it so that Companies have to spend a bunch of money on security stuff. What am I doing to my competitors or potential competitors? Does that raise their cost or lower their cost? That raises. raises their cost, right? So now we're back to the strategy on our spectrum of competition. If there's higher cost of entering, you're gonna get less people entering, which means less competition for Zuckerberg and Facebook and all the other existing companies. So this is a very common theme that you see uh, business is doing and if we had a government whether at city levels state levels federal levels if we had a government that said sorry you're gonna have to do it yourself we're not changing this or um, you know sometimes we have to look through are they are they talking about a real item that's a, a health concern or otherwise or are they just trying to kind of build up a barrier all right so the company looks at this and the value that a customer places on something is the price that they're willing to pay. And so this diagram just kind of breaks down uh, the, the whole value that the customer's getting. I'm sorry, and I said the price, but the price is really right here at 300. So the value to the customer is 400. We have some profit that if it's a competitive market would be normal. And then we have the actual cost of producing the product. All right, 
So the two schools of thought that we're going to look at is, do we look more at the industry or the resources? Um, who said special access to resources? Was that you remember? So when we had um, uh, part of our monopoly barriers was if you had special access to resources. And so that would be kind of more in line with this resource-based view is we got to get the right people, right? We got to get the right people in the right place. And, and so our people are what makes the difference and those sorts of things. And maybe that's part of the, the management angle as well. All right, so the difference here from what we talked about earlier is we have external factors and internal factors. So here, what can we do to create a competitive advantage versus what does the industry look like, the external things? So those are the two things we'll explore here. All right, so how many of you have heard of Michael Porter's five forces? Show of hands. It's a pretty popular thing, especially if you were a business administration major or something. I know a lot of the projects do Michael Porter's thing. Um, and so really, now that I've uh, laid out the characteristics the way we did on the spectrum of competition, all of Michael Porter's things just fall right into that structure, really. So we've got high barriers to entry. We talked about barriers to entry. Low buyer power, low supplier power. So what are some factors there? What are the number of buyers? What are the number of sellers? So in a competitive market, we had a large number of uh, sellers, drops of water in the bucket. I didn't really talk much about the on the consumer side, but in a competitive market, we'd have a lot of consumers as well. So those are the areas we're looking at there. Low threat from substitutes. So if there's an entry into a market, they're creating a substitute, right? So free entry and exit falls into that. And then low levels of rivalry between the existing firms. How, how much uh, um, fighting are there gonna be between the, one, the existing companies that are in there? All right, so uh, using Michael's uh, five forces, we're just going to try to seek an industry. So what do we look at in these five areas? So the suppliers, go ahead and give that a read, number one. So we've had a big supply chain mess with COVID, right? That, that's part of what's been driving some of uh, contributing to some inflation and other problems. Certainly not the leading thing for inflation, but we won't get in on that. But um, you know, how much power do suppliers have? We're starting to learn that a little bit when there is a major disruption that we only have three baby formula suppliers. Why is that? That turns out to be, we go to our list, bing, 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 government driven, right? Baby, we gotta protect the babies. Babies gotta be protected. So in, heaven forbid, they, they must be making crappy baby formula in Germany or, or let alone down in South America somewhere. I'm sure they wouldn't be able to make baby formula the way Americans can make baby formula. I mean, it's crazy, right? So here we have a baby formula shortage and it, it's driven by uh, some of the problems that have been masked over because we didn't have a shock like COVID to the system, which was also at least in part government driven in terms of the reaction to the COVID crisis. Okay, so that's kind of on the supplier side. We see um, the, the advice here from the industrial organization folks is to say, look at your suppliers. Are you getting into an industry where suppliers have a lot of power? You might want to question that or start to seek other alternatives if it's possible. Um, that's going to be something to, to think about. And then the buyers. One of the problems we have in the United States in like the healthcare market, uh, uh, Maria, uh, I always screw up your pronunciation because that J throws me. Say it again. Maria. Maria. All right, so it's like Maria, yeah. Maria. Maria. Um, is uh, with pharmaceuticals, right? So the pharmaceutical industry. Who's the big buyer of pharmaceuticals? Medicare, Medicaid, US government, right? And so um, 
one thing that often gets overlooked is that a lot of times the government is the big buyer power in certain markets. So beware of that and just bear in mind that it might not be a, a traditional consumer, it might be the government who is your buyer and then they might have the thumb on some things that might impact your business. Uh, one of those things here with Ottawa University is higher education. Uh, the government plays a, a, a pretty big role with all the subsidized loans. We're a private, nonprofit university, but our buyers, you guys, our tuition, are getting federal loans, and that's how they're paying for the product. And so now all of a sudden, even though we're a private, nonprofit institution, the government might have a little say in how Ottawa University does business. Because Oh, well, you can do it the way you want to, but we're not going to allow people who need federal student loans to come to your university. So uh, there's only two universities, I think, that don't accept uh, student loans, Hillsdale College and another one in Arkansas that, uh, I think it's Arkansas that does the work thing. So basically all throughout the whole university system, my point is that the government plays a large role because of them subsidizing the buyers of the product. Okay. So, profits get entry. So, patents and licenses, strong brands, you know, we've got Nike, we've got Apple, you know, how good can that do? What do they have to do to maintain a strong brand? What do companies do to maintain their brand name recognition and a strong brand? Advertising, is that, is that free? No, <laughs> right? So uh, we have to spend money to try to keep comp competition out or low or however you wanna phrase it so that we have customers there, we have to keep reminding them. So there's still a price that you're paying to try to bring up that barrier. Um, so it's, it's, uh, it can come in different ways. All right, substitute products. Uh, we talked about already, and then rivalry. So, What's the deal with large fixed costs and this notion of rivalry? What does, uh, what does it mean to have a strong rivalry? Like you guys have been through high schools and maybe college level that there's a big rivalry between Sterling and who's our biggest rival for OU? I think it's Southwestern. Southwestern, yeah. I know there's one that we always have fights with, whether it's out of football maybe, but soccer too. And so what does it mean, what, let's connect this to high fixed costs. So we've talked in previous um, chapters and, and uh, lectures on the ratio of fixed cost to variable cost. So here's your average total cost. One company might have 80% fixed cost and 20% variable as their total cost. And another company might have 20% fixed cost and 80% variable cost. Why would, a high amount of fixed cost cause there to be more uh, rivalry, more fights. What can you do when we have high fixed cost and low no variable cost? What's that? We can increase production. And what about pricing? Can we be more aggressive or less aggressive in the short run, like this week, this month, if I have really low variable cost, which one can I be more aggressive with pricing? With low variable cost, right? So we talked about pricing versus average variable cost. Well, if you have a lot of fixed cost, and of course you wanna make long run profits, but in the short run, let's stick it to them. We can afford to cover our variable cost and cut our price in half and we're still able to cover our variable costs because we have huge fixed costs. This is not a good long run thing, but in the short run we can do it. Let's try to push them out of the market, right? Let's try to get them out of here. So let's cut price. We have a bigger bank account than they do, so they're gonna be forced out. We hold them out and then we get them out of the market, 
right? That's rivalry. So they're, we're using uh, price changes to um, impact our competitors, and so be cautious of that is what Michael Porter is saying uh, in, in certain industries like that. Oh, I put the restaurant thing in here because uh, Mark Rogers was the owner of Legends American Grill, a sports bar and grill restaurant, kind of similar to the Champs chain. But there was another one up in Iowa called Okaboji Grill, another sports bar and grill. And so the rivalry there was Mark said when he, was, he opened up like five different restaurants and he always just picked the one where Okaboji Grill was because he wanted to beat it. Right? So that's the idea of rivalry. Like, I'm going to put it right across the street from you. And uh, I don't know if that's necessarily true, but once the, the, the building is up, the fixed costs are high, and you can go back to that variable cost argument. So it's like a Mexican restaurant putting it next to like a Tex-Mex restaurant? Yeah, yeah. And I heard there's a third Mexican restaurant going into Ottawa now, into the Riverside Diner. Did you guys hear that? Yeah. Just what we needed. Uh, oh, you're excited about it? Oh, because we have it back home. It's really good. Oh, what is it? It's a chain? Oh, okay. Okay, where's home? They have free queso, but not on Mondays. So. Yeah, not on Mondays. Okay. Free queso is good. Not good for the uh, belly, but good. All right. Okay, so um, here's some differences across industries. Um, we're going to get on to that. Um, so, last comment on this part is. Uh, one thing Michael Porter missed out on, that he, a criticism of Porter's argument, is that sometimes it's better to locate both restaurants by each other, right? So something that we call, uh, we see the auto dealers all congregating on the Miracle Mile or whatever we call it, right? So there's some situations where there might be cooperative uh, opportunities. So it's not all about competition. Maybe there's partnership opportunities and other things to where we can both increase the size of the pie. Michael Parter's argument is kind of a zero sum mentality to where there's a fixed amount of business and if I come in, I'm taking away from you. That's not always the case. Maybe together the industry will, will grow. Okay, so the resource-based view. Hey Russ, yeah. for an example on the last one, that'd be like a gas station in a restaurant. Like Part yeah, it could be. Loves. Yeah, it could be part of something like that, or even two gas stations across the street from each other. Okay. By having, by knowing that they're both there, maybe more people will be drawn from other places, and actually, both gas stations can be totally sustainable. Okay. Yeah, and they're not necessarily cooperating with each other, but um, yeah, they could be that too with what you said. All right, so where can we get these advantages from resources? Uh, you know, create a company culture. So here's kind of the resource-based view. Technology, physical capital, human capital. Our people make the difference, right? Uh, organizational excellence. We have lots of additional things that give us an edge and we have happy employees. Uh, so the companies have tried this over time to marrying success. Here's the different strategies, looking for different uh, areas to expand into. So Purdue Chicken was able to put a spin on how they care for their chickens and that their chickens are plumper and better and uh, they were successful with that campaign and selling more chicken that way. And then the lobster company did the same thing and it flopped. Like there are lobsters are cared for and whatever and better and uh, the lobsters are all coming from the same type of place and so anyway that strategy did work with chicken but not with lobster. All right, that is it. So good job, we made it through another evening. Uh, yes.